Hello, my name is Beata. Welcome to another one of my videos. In this one, I will tell you about the symbolism and meaning of Prince of Swords in the Thoth deck. As usual, I will start with the description of the card, and then we will dive deeper into the symbolism of all of the elements that we can see here. I will list the meanings of this card in Divination at the very end of the video, and the timestamp for when I start talking about that is shown below now, so you can jump there if you want. In this card, we can see our prince sitting in a very uncomfortable position in his chariot. Like all other princes in this deck, he is naked, but his body is dark green. He has round yellow wings, and he is holding a sword in his right hand and a sickle in his left. Like the Queen of Swords, he has no animal companion. All other princes have an animal pulling their chariot. He has what looks like three miniature versions of himself. These miniature people look like they are in strange and uncomfortable positions as well. It's also interesting that the reins are attached to their wings rather than to their bodies. Like all other princes, the Prince of Swords is not controlling the movement of his chariot. The reins are not in his hand, but rather looped loosely around his wrist. We can see an interesting geometrical figure in the middle of his chariot. You probably remember it, we saw it before in one of the cards, in a very prominent place. Of course, we also have to mention the very interesting helmet that our prince is wearing, and it looks a bit like a winter hat with a pom-pom on top of it, but we will see in just a moment what it actually is. First, as usual, let's listen to a quote from the Book of Thoth to see what more can Crowley tell us about this card. The chariot which bears him suggests, even more closely, geometrical ideas. This chariot is drawn by winged children, looking and leaping irresponsibly in any direction that takes their fancy. They are not reined, but perfectly capricious. The chariot, consequently, is easy enough to move, but quite unable to progress in any definite direction except by accident. This is a perfect picture of the mind. On the head of this prince is nevertheless a child's head radiant, for there is a secret crown in the nature of this card. If concentrated, it is exactly Tiferet. So we will start by talking about the symbolism of children in this card, and before we do this, I just wanted to remind you to like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe to my channel. You can also show your support by becoming a patron of the channel from just 3 euros per month, so that's a little over 3 dollars. I also accept one-time donations through PayPal. All of the links are in the video description below, Thank you very much for considering this. Your support secures the future of this channel. Okay, let's get back to the Prince of Swords now. We see a similarity here to the Queen of Swords. She has a child's head on top of her throne, and we are told that there is a child's head radiant on our prince's helmet. Now, if you tilt your head and squint, you can see there is something resembling a face painted in black lines in the very middle of the round yellow shape on top of the helmet. Crowley also says that there is a secret crown here. And this all leads us to the helmet of a Persian army commander from the Sasanian era, so from 1st century CE. And we can see here a round fabric knot on top of his helmet, and this element is supposed to resemble a curly knot of hair that is a symbol of nobility. This hairstyle is called korimbos, and its name comes from a Greek word meaning a cluster of fruit or flowers. And we can sometimes see just a top knot of hair, like in this photo, but when it's worn with a crown, the hair is wrapped in silk. And it's not entirely clear what happens when a helmet is worn. Either there is a hole in the top of the helmet to pull the hair through, or a fabric knot is just added on top of the helmet. 
In any case, this is a symbol of nobility, and we can see that kings have significantly larger corimbos than knights. And I think that this is what Crowley means when he talks about a hidden crown, but he also mentions Tiferet, and this will become clear when we start talking about the decans that our prince rules over. We have a link to the Sasanian Empire in this card, because it was very influential on European culture. The military structure had a big influence on Roman army, and royal ceremonies of the Sasanian court were modified and adapted by Romans as well, and through them they influenced the courts of medieval Europe. So we can see here also a big influence on formal diplomacy, and we will see later how it all relates to the character of our prince. We have the head of a child on our prince's helmet, and we also have children pulling his chariot. Children could show here symbolically the purity of thought, the innocent and honest way of looking at the world. Children are also insatiably curious, and this also relates to what we heard in the quote, they are leaping irresponsibly in any direction that takes their fancy. Winged children also remind us of Putti, the little boys with angel wings that appear especially prominently in Renaissance art. In ancient classical art, they had the power of influencing human lives. They were a symbol of passions that push people to action. Only later, they became associated more with Aphrodite or Venus and became cupids. And we can also see here why the prince and the children all look so uncomfortable. It's very easy for the chariot to move, but if you are being pulled in different directions by many different passions, how can you choose where to go? The whole idea here is that of a fidgeting child, being bored with what is currently happening, but also being unable to decide what to do instead. Let's have a look at the wings now. It looks like they are round objects attached to the bodies by geometrical shapes. And there is a certain idea of perfection here, the round yellow shape reminding us of Sixth Sephira Tiferet. There are a lot of round shapes in this card overall. The chariot is almost all round parts, except for the very center of it that we will talk about in just a minute. Crowley tells us that the concentrated nature of this card is Tiferet, and Tiferet is our center, this is the very core of our being, it organizes the other energies around it, like the sun organizes all other planets around itself. So the wings show us the immense possibility here, there is a power of creation present, and we should be able to accomplish great things, if only we could focus our attention for long enough. The geometrical figure inside the chariot, giving it its power, is one of the platonic solids. This is an octahedron, and it's associated with the element of air. And you probably remember it from my video about the Eight of Wands, where I explain more about not only this one, but also other platonic solids in general. We have a lot of yellow in this card, which brings us this solar energy, but we also have a lot of green. And this is of course the color of Netzach, the seventh sephira on the Tree of Life, associated with planet Venus. And this is where we get the creativity from, but when we start talking about the Deccans, we will see that the Venusian energy present in this card is not as beneficial as we would like. The last elements of the card that I would like to mention before we move on to discuss the character of our prince are the two things he's holding in his hands and the sharp geometrical shapes that we can see all over the card. It looks like there is a pattern over the whole image of our prince, and Crowley talks about it in the following way. The operation of his logical mental processes have reduced the air, which is his element, to many diverse geometrical patterns, but in these there is no real plan. They are demonstrations of the powers of the mind without definite purpose. 
In his right hand is a lifted sword wherewith to create, but in his left hand a sickle, so that what he creates he instantly destroys. So the sword here is a symbol of his concentrated will. This is his tool of creation. The sickle is here as a tool of destruction. And the sickle would normally be used to harvest crops, so it has a positive symbolism as well. But we need to remember that if we try to harvest our crops too soon, before they are fully ripe, we will only destroy them. And this is what is happening here. Our prince changes his mind too often. He moves from idea to idea. Whatever he manages to create, he destroys immediately. And we see that the geometrical pattern that is visible all over the card shows us the logical mental process. This is what the element of air has been reduced to here. The mind of our prince is very powerful, but he has no definite purpose. There is not enough focus in him to actually achieve something practical. Now let's see what is the elemental attribution of this card, and this will explain why the energy is so scattered here. Crowley describes this in the following way. This card represents the airy part of air. With its particular interpretation, it is intellectual. It is a picture of the mind as such. As a prince, he is firstly assigned to the element of air, and he is also in the suit of air, swords. And this double airy quality, according to Crowley, shows us the mind. The element of air is our thoughts, our fears, and anything else that is a creation of our conscious or subconscious mind. It has an amazing power, but it needs something else to be able to be productive. Some other influence needs to give this power direction. Without that, the mind can only multiply its own thoughts. It can't actually accomplish anything. Now let's hear another quote that describes the character of the Prince of Swords. A person thus symbolized is purely intellectual. He is full of ideas and designs which tumble over each other. He is a mass of fine ideals unrelated to practical effort. He has all the apparatus of thought in the highest degree, intensely clever, admirably rational, but unstable of purpose, and in reality, indifferent even to his own ideas, as knowing that any one of them is just as good as any other. He reduces everything to unreality by removing its substance and transmuting it to an ideal world of ratiocination, which is purely formal and out of relation to any facts, even those upon which it is based. So we can see here that our prince will be able to argue any point. He can play devil's advocate. His intellect is unmatched. He will, however, fall into the trap of overthinking. We can see that his intellect completely takes over up to the point where even the simplest decisions are impossible to be made. He not only sees both sides of the argument, he sees multiple sides, and they are all equally valid to him. It looks like there is no emotional attachment to anything. Something is missing entirely from his character. This next quote might explain what that is. Immensely powerful because of its complete freedom from settled principles, capable of maintaining and putting forward any conceivable argument, insusceptible of regret or remorse, glib to quote scripture aptly and cunningly to support any thesis soever, indifferent to the fate of a contrary argument advanced two minutes earlier, impossible to defeat because any position is as good as any other, ready to enter into combination with the nearest element available. These elusive and elastic people are of a value 
only when firmly mastered by creative will fortified by an intelligence superior to their own. There is an interesting phrase here, quote scripture, and this comes from a saying that the devil can quote scripture for his own purposes. And our prince can take things out of context, twist their meaning so cunningly that it's very difficult to decipher his tricks. So Crowley confirms here that our prince really has no position of his own. He doesn't believe in anything. He doesn't have any firm values. He can argue any point extremely well, but needs to be directed by a strong will of someone else with a superior intelligence. And this shows us that our prince is more of a hired gun. He can be used by other people to achieve their goals, because he doesn't necessarily know what he wants for himself. And this is actually the key of why he can rarely be made to do other people's bidding. Let's keep reading. In practice, this is rarely possible. There is no purchase to be had upon them, not even by pandering to their appetites. These may nevertheless be stormy, even uncontrollable. Fadists, devotees of drink, drug, humanitarianism, music or religion, are often in this class. But when this is the case, there is still no stability. They wander from one cult or one vice to another, always brilliantly supporting, with the fanaticism of a fixed conviction, what is actually no more than the whim of the moment. So rather than a person, more often some vice or cult may direct our prince in his life choices, but even this will only be a whim of the moment. He can follow any idea religiously, but he can also change his mind about it completely in an instant, as soon as something new, shiny and interesting appears on the horizon. Crowley also warns us, It is easy to be deceived by such people, for the manifestation itself has enormous potency. It is as if an imbecile offered one of the dialogues of Plato. They may in this way acquire a great reputation both for depth and breadth of mind. So our prince, because of being engaged in many interests and fads, can have a lot of superficial knowledge. He can pretend to be quite wise, but really he is just clever. He is too shallow to have true wisdom. I think we are ready to have a look at his decans now. He rules the last decan of Capricorn and the two first decans of Aquarius. The time frame associated with these three decans is from the 10th of January until the 8th of February. Both Capricorn and Aquarius are traditionally ruled by Saturn. And the glyph of Saturn is a sickle, and that's why it appears in this card in the hand of our prince. The energy of Saturn is quite restrictive, and it loves structure, responsibilities, boundaries. This is an isolating energy. It has qualities of earth and water, so coldness is doubled here. Earth is dry and cold, water is cold and wet. The last decan of Capricorn is the four of discs, sun in Capricorn. And this is a very stable and concrete energy. Crowley says it dominates and stabilizes everything, but manages its affairs by negotiation. He also mentions that it represents law and order, maintained by constant authority and vigilance. This decan shows us his ability to get totally immersed and become a fanatical follower of some idea, religion, philosophy he will be able to argue the righteousness of his adopted cause with great strength until he finds another cause that in the moment looks more interesting. The four of discs usually shows us success. This is confidence. This is someone who's dependable. And this is also working for what you want and being able to achieve your goals. 
Our prince is definitely not a dependable person, but he can pretend to be one. He can present an illusion of stability when he is currently fanatically following some idea. He will give something his full undivided attention, but it's a temporary phase for him rather than his actual character. The first decan of Aquarius is the Five of Swords. This is Venus in Aquarius. And this is where we get the Venusian influence from in this card, and we can see that this placement is not really beneficial for Venus to be able to act out all of her most beneficial qualities. Five of Swords shows us a lot of fear that is blocking our ability to fully express ourselves. We have been hurt before, and this makes us cruel towards others. This card often shows a person that spreads gossip, works against their enemies in secret, behind their backs. The Five of Swords shows us that our prince cannot be trusted. Because he doesn't truly believe in any rules, or doesn't even care about simple decency, he will be shamelessly doing whatever he needs to, to achieve his goals or prove his point. The second decan of Aquarius is the Six of Swords, and this is Mercury in Aquarius. This is where our prince gets his incredible intellect from. This card shows us intellectual clarity. This is the pure idea of science. We have to remember, though, that in that card, the heart was very important. Everything worked in such a perfect balance because we were following our heart. Our prince has lost this important part. When we combine this card with the Five of Swords, we can see that the only thing left is cold logic. It becomes now the soulless mechanism that acts out of fear and pain. Now I'm going to tell you a bit about how to interpret this card in divination. If this card describes an action, this will be the inability to act. This is overthinking a decision that leads us nowhere. If this card describes a person, this will be someone very intelligent. This person is able to argue with anyone. They are also able to argue any point. Prince of Swords doesn't have any firm beliefs. He's changeable, like a flag in the wind. He can't really decide what he wants. He may have a lot of different interests. And I think we all know someone who is a bit like that. They are currently completely immersed in some hobby, some idea or philosophy. But we also remember that a few months ago they were into something completely different. The character of this person makes them vulnerable to fall into some negative lifestyle choices. They can get into a cult or some similar organization that demands complete control over your life. The good thing is that their involvement in anything will be temporary and they will eventually lose interest and move on to something else. Prince of Swords is quite a difficult character, and it's hard to find a positive side to him. He can have a tendency to be unhappy with his life, but also he's unable to find a solution to his problems. He overthinks everything to death, and it's very difficult for him to make a definite plan of what he needs to do. And this is usually going to be someone well-educated and creative. They will gather knowledge, but it's difficult for them to have any real wisdom. This is very often someone who likes to use quotes to support their arguments. And he can be interested in philosophy and psychology, but he lacks empathy, so he uses his knowledge of psychology to manipulate people. These people enjoy philosophical debates, but their over-intellectualized approach can be very draining to other people. As a partner, Prince of Swords will be quite difficult, as you can imagine. This person likes their freedom, they are quite independent and private. They don't really like for anyone to know their secrets, and they are not likely to be in touch with their feelings. It's very difficult for them to form a really healthy bond with a partner. 
If the Prince of Swords shows up in your reading as advice, it will tell you to just come up with new ideas without deciding what you're going to do. This is a time to think about things and discuss them with others, but it's not a time when you make a decision. As an obstacle, on the other hand, this card will show you that you are too much in your head. You need to stop overthinking and just start acting. Follow your heart and your gut feeling, rather than trying to find a logical solution. In terms of jobs that the Prince of Swords could be good at, he could definitely be a great lawyer or a diplomat. He would make a successful politician as well. Also, he could be a conman or a salesman, especially someone who knows that what they are selling has no real value. This could also be someone who is a gambler or someone involved in a cult or any similar shady organization. Among movie characters who fulfill this archetype, we can definitely mention Saul Goodman, played by Bob Odenkirk in Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. He is the perfect sleazy lawyer who finds himself representing just about any type of big or smaller criminal. He really can't help himself when it comes to bending the rules and arranging complex hoaxes to give himself an edge in winning a case. We can also mention here Frank Abenail Jr., played by Leonardo DiCaprio in Catch Me If You Can. This is where we can see the love of freedom that is so characteristic of our prince. When the law finally catches up with Frank, he is offered a job, but he hates the idea of having to be in an office on time and following all of the rules of a steady office job. And we can see him squirm at the very thought of being restricted in this way. He loves his adventures and the fact that he is able to travel anywhere on a whim and weasel his way through almost any trouble. That's it for today, thank you so much for watching and please remember to like the video, leave a comment and of course subscribe to my channel. I would like to thank everyone who is already supporting the channel, I appreciate your help very much. And if you want to help secure the future of this channel, please consider a one-time PayPal donation or you can become my patron for just 3 euros per month and once 100 people sign up for my Patreon, all of the patrons will be able to suggest and vote for future content of the channel. So, if you want to have your say in what videos I create next, click on the link in the video description below. Every little bit of support and every donation is great help and is greatly appreciated. Once again, thank you all for today and I will see you in the next video about the Princess of Swords very soon. Thank you, bye!